So I think we'll just kick off. That's six o'clock. We promise to be prompt because you're all very, very busy people. Welcome to, uh, I think it's the fourth now in our series of roundtables speaking about the, the Round Britain Climate Challenge. And I'm delighted you're, you've joined us this evening. It's going to be quite exciting. They tend to be one of the most fastest passing hours of all time. We are going to hear from Sasha Dench, who is going to tell us a bit about this incredible adventure. But before she does, uh, I want to just kind of briefly set the scene for what we're going to be doing. We're going to be speaking to some phenomenally interesting, exciting people. All of us are connected to Sasha in some way, and they'll tell you a bit about that. We're hoping you're going to be connected also to Sasha because of her spirit of adventure, because that's exactly the sort of thing we need in Scotland and the UK as we approach COP26. What we cannot be is nervous and bowing under the pressure of Climageddon. This is the time the world needs people to be adventurers, to be explorers, to be astronauts, and to be fearless. So I think it's really, really important that, you know, we change our mindset from tackling climate change as a cliff edge, because no one would jump off that, well, very few, and think about mountains. So we need to think about how do we approach climate change, which is really dangerous and really challenging, really complex, but we need to approach it with the right sort of mindset. And I think tonight you're going to see some uh, of the people who I think are being the most adventurous out there. So I'm kind of just waiting on someone joining us. I'm not sure they're quite here yet. So I wonder if at this point I should maybe go to, I'll tell you a bit about the speakers first. That may be a good idea. So we've got Sasha Dench and we've got uh, Ipsita Batia, Ka Holmes, Mauricio Bermudez, Neighbour. These are fantastic names, aren't they? They're terrific. And uh, Martin Tangney, that's an easier name, but uh, he's absolutely amazing. And Keith Jones. So these, these people here are going to come on and speak to us very, very soon. So I think without further delay, I'm going to invite a special guest to come on and say a few words to Sasha. So over to you, please, Nigel. I think you may be on mute, Nigel. And there is a punishment for that, which we'll tell you about later. It involves getting people to sign up the counters in. Sasha's now relieved that it's not an old boyfriend from school. <laughs> I told her, Nigel, there was going to be someone that, you know, was going to come on and say something and she'd been worried for about the last week. How's that? Can we ditch the headphones for a moment? Will that make it work? Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> I don't know. I've been doing this all day, every day, for 18 months, and I still can't get it right. Um, um, so, well, sorry, th th thank you for allowing me to, 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 to gate crash. I just wanted to say that um, Sasha came to, to, to visit me in, in our little garden in Totnes a very long time ago, Sasha, and I loved her vision. Um, and her kind of can-do attitude then, and I'm thrilled that she's about to start and, and break multiple world records. And I just wanted to, you know, I have this wonderful job of being called the high-level climate action champion, but I'm, I'm a desk jockey, right? I do all that sitting down here, and you really are an action champion, Sasha. I want to wish you the very best of luck, um, and thank you for putting yourself out there and for innovating um, you know, with, with the electrification, which I think when we first talked was was just a vague idea, right? And you've made it happen. And I think, you know, you're, you're such a role model to everybody who looks to evidence of taking action rather than just talking about how difficult things are or about how much they're going to do in 50 years' time. So really, I just wanted to say, say a huge thank you. The best bit of my job is to applaud the champions like you getting on and doing amazing stuff. Um, and, it, and it's wonderful to see that you've got so much support already, and I'm sure you're going to garner tons of support all around the country and we'll do whatever we can to bring attention to your your feats of daring which are not only breaking records in terms of adventure but also crucially bringing attention to the the crisis that we're all facing that we're all so passionately trying to mobilize around so Sasha thank you hugely and the best of luck um, and may you break many records. Sasha do you want to say anything to Nigel before thank he has you. to hop off? Thank you. It was actually sitting in the garden with Nigel and I was saying, well, I'm going to try and like partially go electric with the paramotor maybe because no one's really tested this in any long distance. And he kind of said, it has to be all electric. And at that point it was like, oh no, there's nothing like waving a challenge in front of someone like me. I was like, okay, 
how are we going to make this happen? So not only are we going to break a record flying around the country, tell stories of champions who are doing amazing things for climate, show how climate is affecting this country, but I also have to do it in a method of transport that's never been tested before on lo long distance journeys. But that's exactly, as, as Nigel said, that's exactly what this is about, is trying stuff that hasn't been done before and, and not being scared of it. So um, yeah, thanks for the inspiration and uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> Right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Nigel. All the best. Thanks, bye, keep, keep fighting the good fight. Will do. And you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So you're going to want to hear from Sasha pretty soon, because I'm going to shut up very, very soon. But the one thing I want to say is that but Sasha doesn't just do death-defying, death fantastic adventures. She also set up Conservation Without Borders. You can Google and find out who they are, and you'll read about the mission and the, and the, and the, the things they do. But it's so much more than that. This is people who, honestly, I've never met so such solution forces solution focus individuals that just want to break through and just get stuff done so you're going to love working with cwb you're going to love supporting sasha you're going to enjoy this event and i think now it's time to hear from sasha to tell us about this amazing adventure and how these people on here have come on giving up their time how we can get involved and help you thank you Thank you very much, Martin. And thank you for bringing Nigel along. That was a fantastic surprise. Um, I Yes, for those of you who have not been into to one of our events before and who are not working with already, very briefly, as Martin mentioned, Conservation Without Borders, whilst you might know me as being a, an ambassador for the UN Convention on Migratory Species and be asking, why are you doing a flight around Britain? There's no, no migratory species I can think of that fly around, around Britain. Um, there's, yeah, a particular reason, on, on my last, let me, let me start with that, so on my last expedition, um, there were, whilst there was from the Russian Arctic to the UK also flying by paramotor, one of the key things that I noticed from it was that of all the challenges for the birds along that migratory flyway, climate change was the exacerbating factor in pretty much all of those different things. The second thing was that last year in January, we lost our family home in the Australian bushfires. And that was a moment where I had to really look at climate change and think, uh, okay, uh, it's been a, something I've spoken about as an intellectual fact. I've seen it with my own eyes, but it makes it very different when it becomes very local. It's obviously, it's our own house. Um, to see it with your own eyes and see how it's affecting your local area really, really changes things for you. Um, so that was the core behind uh, picking up climate change specifically this year and then it was being made a, a champion for for counter sin that I thought okay what can conservation without borders do in the UK and you might be guessing from conservation without borders our title that the it refers to migratory species crossing many different borders but in reality um, it also was intended to be about taking conservation outside of the world of conservation organizations and trying to reach out to the ordinary people, but also bring companies in on a much deeper level than, than many of them are um, at the moment. And so that's kind of some of the core reasons behind it. And then where did we come up with the idea of flying with an electric paramotor around the UK? Well, that was obviously, I can't take climate change seriously and not look at the, the aircraft that I fly and the expedition vehicles that we use. So obviously with a with a paramotors, which is what I fly, it's basically a paraglider wing. Uh, so I can use air, I can use updrafts, thermals and things like that, but I do use a petrol motor. So first of all, it was, can I switch from a petrol motor to, an, to, a, to a battery um, and charge it wherever possible without fossil fuels? The second thing obviously was, uh, electrifying the, the vehicles that we use. Can we do long distance expedition like that and in the UK? And so that's where we've got to doing an expedition all around Britain. And the longest journey I could come up with was all the, the coast of Britain, but also starting and ending in Glasgow at COP26. Felt like it was really a really important thing to do. So that's the core of it. And then I looked at the differences that we had between the electric motor we think can probably do about between half an hour and an hour of flights generally with a petrol motor I can do about three hours. The positive side of that is that I will be taking off and landing in lots of different people with in lots of different places. So we have a fantastic opportunity to not only take aerial images and share with people stories of 
um, climate change through amazing visual images from the air, but we can also stop and speak to people on the ground. So that's the core of the expedition is to firstly try and break a Guinness World Record by flying all around the coast of Britain. Um, but secondly, try and basically get the whole country asking if Britain drove the Industrial Revolution, can we drive the Green Revolution too? And to tell that story through the amazing stories of people that we'll meet along the way. Um, and the second thing, well, part of that is obviously telling some of the stories of people who are going to be on our panel tonight, which I'm really excited by. The second thing we want to do is to tell politicians that not only are companies behind bold ambitions on climate change, but also the public, mass public support is there to back bold actions on climate change. And the key way we want to do that is through rallying mass signups to counter sin, which Ipsita is going to talk about a bit later on as well. So with that, um, the, the basic nuts and bolts of the expedition is me in the air, the ground crew of three vehicles with a media production team helping to tell the stories and allow people to share the whole journey. Some of that will be with me in the air, others will be on the ground speaking to people, some of it is even going to be underwater. But I um, hope it's going to be a really inspiring, exciting ex uh, expedition that people from politicians to school kids and farmers are going to want to follow. And so with that, back to you, Martin. That's fantastic, uh, Sasha. Your, your enthusiasm is infectious. Uh, I shouldn't say infection at this particular time, but you get the point. So you're going to be doing really, really dangerous, adventurous things. So what can we do? So I, I'm, asking, I'm encouraging people to get on that post and to start posting some offers of support because this is no such thing as a free lunch. So we really need to be getting involved here. Uh, one of the best ways to do that, if not the best way to do that, is to follow the counters in. And who best, and I see we've got Maurizio, Chal Maurizio, and we've got Ipsy who are here to tell us about it. But if Ipsy can come on the screen now and tell us a bit about counters in and especially how we can get involved. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Martin. And um, thanks again, Sasha, for sharing your story. I feel like every single time I hear it, there's just shivers that run down my spine. And I'm uh, extremely excited to personally be a, be a part of this, but also that the Countessin is going to be with you up in the air um, and kind of really just throughout. Um, so I thought it might be helpful for me to share a little bit about what Countessin is all about. Um, maybe just a minute or two and then of course get into how you can get in involved um, as individuals as part of your organization and really just bringing your entire ecosystem in. Um, so Countess in, our mission is to inspire 1 billion people to take meaningful climate action by 2030 that will not only reduce carbon pollution but also um, inspire leaders to act boldly to deliver the systems change that we need. At the heart of it really though is, is people. It's all about individuals and organizations coming together to do four things. Um, and it's one, take practical steps to make changes that matter in their own personal lives, protect what they love um, from climate change and four, share it with others and influence and inspire others to do the same. What we're doing is we're really building on and complementing the incredible successful work that has been done already at a, um, at a policy level, as well as by businesses, by, by, by making really ambitious and awesome uh, net zero uh, targets. And at the same time, by the climate movement and really driving, the, driving change and bringing the conversation to the forefront. Uh, what we do is what we want to do on top of that is to tr inspire and empower really citizens um, so that we can all play our part. And as I think Martin was referring to, and I love the word, be fearless about, about taking action and go on this adventure together to really show that when we all act and all come together, we can be bigger than the, our, the sum of our parts is much more bigger than the individual so it's really about um, tackling what what might normally feel like an overwhelming challenge but actually saying yes we can do this in a hopeful and optimistic way 
Um, we're run by a, a radical collaboration. Um, and again, one of the reasons I mentioned this is because we're bigger than, than, than uh, individual organizations. And one of those organizations um, is Accenture. And we have Maurizio with us today, um, which is really awesome. I'm excited for him to share a little bit more uh, later. And really what we wanted to do is we wanted to put our skills and our passion together uh, to create something that we thought was one exclusive, uh, sorry, inclusive, impactful, and extremely influential. Um, we're different from um, traditional campaigns in that what we're trying to do is that we're not asking people to come and join Countessin, rather we're asking everyone to spread the word about Countessin. And we're doing that through our partners uh, and we have over 90 at the moment. Um, and it's all about really meeting people where they're at and making sure that the messages feel relevant and that they resonate with people and that we're reaching people through their or organizations, through their faith groups, to their sports teams, because again, if if someone was to take action, it's really doing it within their tribe is a lot more impactful um, than, than um, taking it in, in a way that doesn't actually fit into a group that they're aware of or that they belong to. Uh, so we're also really proud to be the citizen call to action for the Race to Zero as well as COP26 and really amazing to have Nigel as a senior sponsor as well of, of Countess In. So um, that brings me to uh, the Round Britain Climate Challenge and uh, the Guinness World Record. We're extremely uh, thrilled to, to partner with uh, Conservation Without Borders and to uh, do this alongside Sasha and be a part of the record-breaking record expedition. We're so inspired by what uh, Sasha is doing. And as she had mentioned, that she's not only going to be in the air taking photos and showing uh, people um, uh, around as, as she flies around Britain, but also stopping along and speaking to people and, and really finding these insp inspiring voices around climate and, and solutions. And on top of that, what we're hoping is that that inspires um, action that people want to do more. And we hope that um, the month of June and beyond will, is really gonna be the beginning of what we think is a wave of action on climate change. So as, um, as individuals and as businesses, uh, I want to encourage everyone on this call to one, follow Sasha along on her journey, two, uh, listen to and be inspired by, by the stories that she's gonna be highlighting along the way. And then of course, turn that uh, inspiration into action by taking steps. And we hope that you do that in your own you know, communities, families, in your immediate networks. And then, of course, if you would like to do that within your organizations, just drop me a note. There's really incredible ways that you can do that as, as part of your, you know, em, uh, employee engagement plans, really kind of bringing in um, your, your workforce into saying that, you know, you've made, whether, whether you've made uh, net zero commitments or not, this is something really practical that everyone can, um, can, can be a part of and get involved in. Um, and like I said, no, no matter what kind of step is taken, whether it's big or small, the point is at the end, you are all being counted. It's all counted towards something bigger and it all matters. And we're ultimately going to break that uh, Guinness World Record. Thank you and can't wait to count you in. We absolutely are going to break that world record. The, the, the question you get asked most of the time, and everyone gets asked this, is climate change is really tough. What do you think we can do about it? Well, well, let's just do stuff. Let's just get involved. Let's just go and find the easiest opportunities to try and make some difference. And it is that simple. If you get enough people motivated to try and think about inspiring the, the, the outcomes that we know we need and the world needs, then we need to do it. Stop looking over your shoulder for somebody else to solve this problem because it's not there. these people aren't there. These people are you. So it's so exciting to hear that. And, that. and I'm looking at who's going to come and speak to us next, which is Keith Jones, a National Trust Environment Advisor. And, and, I, and I look at these people that speak tonight with pure envy because every single job there is, that's kind of one of the dream jobs on the planet, isn't it? Is, is to, to be trusted to work with the National Trust. So, so maybe you can tell us, Keith, about how you got involved with the Round Britain Climate Challenge, Sasha, and how you're going to help 
Thank you. I think mo most of this stuff is more luck than planning. Happened to be ha having a chat with somebody who was having a chat and it, it just, it's networks, it's communication. And so I think that the Round Britain Challenge grabs attention. And I think that that's what we need more than anything else because it, there's too much doom and gloom on uh, climate change. It, if there is no upside to it, why bother? Just live the party, let everything uh, destroy itself and then see, what, see what's left. Uh, the, the one thing I've said internally in the trust and to a lot of external people is actually climate change will be solved by, by stories, by themes, by challenge on it. We've got the technology now. Why are we not using it? I think one of the examples I've been asked to talk about is some work we did uh, with, I think it's still the largest marine source heat pump in the UK. So we're using the heat from the sea to replace an oil fired uh, heating system in quite a large mansion. But we've actually learned from stuff uh, such as the RNLI, because they've been doing work like this for years. If you're working with a the sea, there's no better partner than the RNLI. So that was, it's, it's working, it was quite successful. But then it was again sharing, what did you learn? And so Adnams, the brewery down in Southwold, came, then came to us because they've got an awful lot of waste heat from making gin. So we've got the RNLI, we've got gin, we've got mansions. We actually looked at um, Festival Hall in London because since the 1950s, it's been harvesting and cooling uh, from the Thames, which also uh, we also learned from the Sydney Opera House. So to me, there is no unique solution. There's no new ideas. It's just recycling, reusing ad and adapting an awful lot of stuff um, that's out there. I've usually got quite a powerful side with gin, oil and a lifeboat just to show people that we all have the same challenges. We're just looking at it uh, in a different way. Absolutely. Absolutely terrific. Thank you for that. I think when there'll be certain person on this panel coming up speaking soon, Martin, whose ears must have picked up when you spoke about alcohol, basically, and he can tell you a bit about that. So this event has been made possible by lots and lots of support and sponsors, but none more so than our headline sponsor. So we are, on behalf of Sasha, everyone, we are just so grateful for the support from uh, EDF. So, Ka, maybe you can come on and tell us a bit about why someone like Sasha could rock up at your office or send you an email and you feel this is so important that you wanted to get involved. Be glad you oh. are, but tell us how that worked. Okay. Um, well, we firstly, I think we thought that we could be a great partner to the, um, to the expedition. Um, our purpose at EDF is to help Britain achieve net zero. We're the biggest generator of zero carbon electricity in the country through our wind, nuclear and solar plants. And we're a, a leader in electric vehicles and energy efficiency. So it's kind of in our... It's in our purpose. Um, and we also thought that we can provide real practical support to the expedition. So we have sites all around the coast of, of Britain. Um, our power stations have um, biodiversity benchmark awards. And um, we've got really good links with local communities and local community groups around them. So we think we can help to, to tell some of the local stories. Um, the expedition is going to be um, charging up its batteries at our wind farms and nuclear plants and EV um, charge points when it when it can um, and we've got a workforce of, of people who are really engaged in the in the topic and a customer base as well so we think that we can contribute a lot of people to the counter-scene initiative mm. fantastic thank you for that sorry about the pauses i'm flick, flicking between buttons and i'm a man of a certain age with That's bad good. vision uh, see before we go to uh, maritio from accenture can you Joe, just quickly have a glance at the the, the chat box, have you seen who's here tonight? Have you had a look at the diversity of people who come from across the spectrum? The one thing I, I want to point to your attention, the reason why this happens is because of Sasha and it's because of this hope over fear narrative. It's because of this optimism, not outrage. And it's because of, we may not have all the answers, but we're going to be damn busy chasing them. We're not going to be fearless. We're not going to, we're not going to be fearful. We're going to keep going. I, I think it's something is people, commentators don't often think about is that, you know, if you mobilise hope, you can kind of abolish fear. And when you're looking at these people, and everyone here is super, super busy, when you look at the names and the kind of organisations, but my goodness, this is so encouraging to see. 
And those names just aren't up there for, for, for sure. Please reach out to Geraldine from Mabbit, reach out to Noel McMartin, reach out to Ash Penley. Every solution that you've dreamt of that, that needs to exist for climate change is here. So let's just start joining the dots. Speaking of joining the dots, a dreadful link that was, uh, Accenture are one of the biggest, most impressive organizations in the world. I'm a huge fan of Peter Lacey and Julie Sweet. I'm going to be a really huge fan of Maurizio when he tells us a bit about how he's going to convince half a million employees to sign up to count us in. Maurizio, over to you. Martin, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, thank you uh, for Conservation Without Borders for the invitation. And, and Sasha, I also want to express, you know, kind of my, you know, the awe and inspiration that you're providing is fantastic. I mean, what an antidote to range anxiety. Um, I, I, I think, you know, that is, is, is fantastic to see, you know, what you're going to, I know you're going to achieve, you know, a very powerful message with this project. So, you know, I'm, I'm also like just echoing everyone's comments of uh, how cool is it going to be? I really look forward to seeing, you know, the output of, of your journey. So uh, let me just begin by saying, uh, you know, we, we've started with Nigel actually, uh, you know, from very early days and among, you know, uh, many other of the radical collaboration that is count us in today as, as Ipsy described it, you know, when Nigel, you know, uh, we've known for a long time, uh, you know, uh, was named the high level champion. We said, well, you know, we need to get people mobilized. We need, you know, businesses mobilized. Uh, just as you know, we need the policymakers, you know, there's that, that flywheel, that you know, virtuous circle that we really need to enable between you know business policy and 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 people, and we saw a fantastic opportunity as you said, Martin, a 550,000 now scaringly, uh, you know, employee organization, uh, a, a real opportunity at the intersection of two points of that flywheel of you know business and 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 our employees as citizens, uh, you know, and, and said, well, what if we got you know uh, that employee base mobilized around taking action on climate, you know, what if we got you know their networks, and of course, you know, we're already you know doing a bunch of things through our uh, Echo Challenge you know program, which has been going on you know for five years now, and you know where we're getting you know get our employees excited about this, but you know we 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 hadn't really thought about it at that scale. And that's when we went to Nigel Topping with the idea and he said, you know what, you know, there's a few others thinking very much along those lines. Let's do something about it. That's kind of how it began. And, um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's hugely uh, inspiring as well, sorry to reuse the term, to see, you know, how far, you know, that has come now, you know, with, uh, you know, with, you know, those, you know, uh, tens and tens of, of partner organizations, you know, from multiple, you know, from businesses to faith groups, to sports organizations, to you know, high visibility individuals, and um, you know what's what's most exciting for me is you know what began about you know let's let's see if there's a platform for the citizens for individuals to take action. Now has evolved into we're creating an ecosystem. You know we're creating an ecosystem of you know there's the counters in platform and we work with our fantastic partners do nation to create that. But now we have other platforms coming in uh, to join their effort and that we can aggregate the collective impact of all those individuals taking action on climates. And so we have 16 steps, you know, that were devised, as, as Ipsy said, you know, in, in, informed by lots of research with United Nations Environment Program and others feeding in. But there's other platforms also coming in with different approaches and methodologies to solve this very hard problem, which is behavioral change. And we feel that ecosystem of, you know, many different approaches to, um, to, to, uh, uh, to you know, uh, deliver that behavioral change is the way forward because you know we're going to have to learn and we're going to have to also collaborate you know very much in the spirit of that ecosystem is also sharing data sets you know coming together as a community to share learnings of what's working and what's not working to uh, affect uh, behavioral change and so you know the invitation here to yourselves as individuals as members of organizations as member of uh, other types of collectives is you know, come, you know, join us, have a look, get others in, in, engage. You know, the more, the more we are here, the, you know, the, uh, I think, you know, the, the bigger the snowball uh, becomes and, you know, the, the, the faster the flywheel uh, starts turning. And, you know, we show that employers can engage their uh, employees to take action. You know, governments will take note, other parts of the world, other parts of, uh, of the economy and, and, and the ecosystem takes note and we can, you know, continue to further enhance that action. So, yeah, let, please, please do join us, have a look, get in touch, you know, many, many ways to, uh, uh, to get involved. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Martin and team. 
absolutely fantastic. We're going to go rapid now to uh, get to our last speaker. And some that was saying you leave the best to the last. I'm not sure how that will work because the next speaker is someone I've known for a long time who is unbelievable, as you'll soon see. One thing is that Mauricio said is that the, about platforms. Platforms are where people gather to go on a journey. So if you think about that, if you've got Russell Douglas on, who I'll, I'll invite on later on when we get into the discussion, creating an amazing net zero trans accelerator platform, because this is the chance for us to help each other. So Martin, uh, tell us about the amazing work that you're doing at Celtic Renewables and how, what interested you specifically about getting involved in this? Thank you, sir. Am I the only one who finds it weird when you talk to somebody who has your own name? So hi, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I came across Sasha through Martin, who told me the story about what she was doing. And it, like two thoughts came straight to my head. The first one is suspending herself in midair with Bridget Jones pants uh, and an overgrown hairdryer uh, means there's something seriously wrong with that girl. Like that, That's just not right. But, but the second thing was she is right. Uh, so COP26, I'm living in Edinburgh. And COP26 in Glasgow, as you all know, it's on our doorstep and it cannot be uh, 10 days in November and it's come and gone. It can't be. It, it must be more than that. And what Sasha is doing is building the momentum to give the COP conference a mandate from the people to actually stop setting targets and, and stop talking about all the things we will do and to actually do it. And we can't let this one go. We really can't. So I was more than happy to get involved in this one uh, and because what she can do is raise attention and bring people to the table to give the negotiators the mandate to do something to actually act and what we do as a company my company is called celtic renewables and we've taken i didn't even invent the process it's it's 100 years old it was it was born to make uh, these chemicals one of which was used to make explosives so this came into the world to help destroy each other and then they died out and now we're trying to bring it back again to help save each other so the raw materials that we use in this biological process are waste and residues that are generated by other industries. So in Scotland, the biggest source for me of raw materials comes from the whiskey industry. So like less than 10% of what goes in the front door of a distillery comes out as whiskey at the back end of it. So we can take that other than 90% of biological material and take it from low value residues that are a problem to get rid of and convert them into high value, low carbon compounds that the world needs that are currently coming from petrochemicals. So when people talk about decarbonization and, and cutting carbon emissions, that in its own is not enough, you know, because we still need to replace the compounds that we're using. Uh, and if there's anything that, that uh, the lockdown has taught us all is that we can and probably forever will live differently. No, it wasn't, it wasn't by choice, that's for sure. Uh, and I don't think we'd ever want to, to see the world in that position again, but a lot of people had to stay at home and not go to work and work differently at home and live their lives differently and perhaps maybe not wear the same clothes as often uh, or what you know just every little thing about your lives was changed by this and i'll give you an example one, one thing for us that happened at the end of last year was we did a crowd fund so we're not you know the likes of say brew dog or someone who who make beer that you will buy and you'd be interested in us because you drink their beer we make products that we haven't made yet actually in this factory which isn't finished and all we were selling to people was an idea of what we could do that would be different. And two and a half thousand people put nearly four million pounds into this business because of an idea. And I think that reflects the change in mindset that has grown out of COVID. And, and that's why what Sasha is doing really, really, really uh, enthuses me because she's, she's harnessing that change in mindset. She's getting people to focus their attentions differently and look at COP26 and go, this is what we will do now. Not we're going to talk about it. This is what you must do here and now. And you need to innovate your way out of a lot of this. Because like I said a while ago, you can't simply just not do things. We need to replace the things, whether it's electricity or fuel or chemicals or, or everything that we use now. We're still going to want to use them. We just need to make them differently and more sustainably. And as Martin said early on, it was an industrial revolution led to this. Well, we need another revolution. Sasha mentioned the Green Revolution. And there's no, um, one of the other reasons we're involved in this is because it's good for us. Let's be unashamedly honest about this. I get publicity out of being associated with this. And again, there's nothing wrong with that because industry needs to be commercially viable as well as sustainable. And if we're gonna grow a new bioeconomy and a new sustainable economy, all of those industries must be commercially viable. It will not survive on charity and donations, it won't. 
So there's nothing wrong with doing something that's commercially right and saving the planet. That's how the Industrial Revolution started in the first place, was you did things differently uh, and it resulted, of course, in, in the consequences that we're now facing. But there's no reason why we can't redress that. We have the technology, we have the skills. There are far better innovators than me out there who need to bring their ideas to the market and do things in a different and sustainable way. And if there's one thing that, that the COVID crisis has shown us is that people can adapt and we can do things differently. And I'm sure we will. And that's why we're absolutely delighted as a company to support what Sasha is doing because she's going to go around the country, mad and all as she might be, but she's going to go around the country and capture those stories and capture the, the innovators and the thoughts and hopefully harness it so that when COP does happen in Glasgow, as I hope it does, goes ahead the way it does in Glasgow in November, there is a firm mandate from everybody to make these negotiators go in and get something done. The time for talking has kind of stopped here and I want to see more Celtic Renewables companies growing all over the country and I want great innovation to inspire and build and commercially grow our way out of the problem we have now because we can. Yeah, that's the end of my rant. There you go. Thank you. Well, Martin, as usual, uh, amazing. I'm doing my best to help Kirsten with Renewables. I'm drinking a lot of whiskey, so there will be lots of waste generated. So, so there you go. Don't, you know, I'm selfless. Uh, <laughs> Look again at the chat and you'll see everybody's now making each other offers. I can see Inga and Charlotte hooking up. This is the point of these events. You need to get together and start to make things happen. Speaking about making things happen, there is a person in Scotland who probably even more enthusiastic than I am, which seems unusual. I know, trust me on this one, Russell Douglas. I'm going to ask Russell to come on in a second and tell us in his inevitable fashion why Scotland is. And again, I know this is Britain and that's really important, but I'm focusing on Scotland just for the evening, if you don't mind indulging us for a while. Russell, Tell me why Scotland is the greatest place in the world to do net zero transition and what Scottish Business Network is going to do to help Sasha, please. I think this is a remarkable time for Scotland. And it's, it's remarkable that we have the UN summit coming to Scotland and coming to the UK. But if this is remembered as being COP26, we will have failed. We have to create change and we have to motivate the whole of Scotland to get involved in this UN summit and make this a remarkable experience. Scotland has taken a lead in the creation roundabout innovation to create the sustainable economy, to look at wind, to look at waves, to look at different ways of doing things. But we have a moment to pull together, not us, the people who are committed, but everyone else, everyone that's sitting currently watching Coronation Street. We want to get them involved. We've successfully built a global community of Scots and this issue matters to them and they are proud of what Scotland is doing. So by using Sasha's challenge as a way to highlight this issue, to highlight the hopes for the UN summit, and perhaps to motivate an entire nation in Scotland to get involved, that's what we want to do. So I praise Sasha and we'll be there all along. We have coverage across the whole of the country. You can land wherever you like, but most importantly, what we have to do is we all have to create this noise. Because though we think everyone's involved, they're not. We will be sitting here in George Square in Glasgow on the 31st of October, and someone will go, is there anything happening next week? Our job is to motivate them all and make sure they know this is happening. And it's down to us, but it's down to us to use Sasha's mission as the rallying call to get everyone off talking about COP26 in talking about the positivity we can create by helping to resolve the climate change emergency. I think you can all see now why I asked Russell to come on, because sometimes there's something about the Scots, the mentality is we're a kind of doer, but we're actually doers, see what I did there? But actually, when we get our mojo, we're kind of unstoppable and we become really quite relentless. And again, as well as Irish, I'm looking at Martin there on the screen. But just to show our international focus, I'm going to ask uh, one of my favourite Italian people in the whole world, Izzy. If Izzy can come on and tell us a bit about it. And you, you've heard from a massive big business and you've heard from super huge businesses. Let's hear from a, a kind of relative SME who is really making amazing, amazing things happen in, in Scotland. Izzy, do you want to tell us how you can help, please? Thank you, Martin. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I would like to support your journey, Sasha. I think uh, the work that you are doing is uh, extremely inspiring and we need that. We need uh, boldness uh, the most. Um, 
our business uh, has been working on uh, sustainability uh, learning and the uh, circular economy agenda from the 2010 uh, in Scotland and uh, before I am an environmental scientist involved in climate mitigation so I've been working at this course for a long time and it has been very frustrating uh, especially from the approach uh, of B Corps. Um, you know, um, it is difficult to change a big organization or a nation, but it's easier to change behaviors so as you are trying to inspire. And not just it is easier to change SMEs. SMEs are uh, flexible, they are uh, pivoting quickly, and they can uh, essentially shape themselves around the climate cause. And the SMEs are the largest majority of uh, uh, companies around the planet. So we can totally change the game. And I think this is the opportunity. The opportunity is to inspire as many as uh, small and independent businesses as possible to band together, to create a narrative that is essentially is the opposite of greenwashing. It is about commitment and responsibility for the future. And I do think that uh, small actions are making the difference. So we are launching now um, probably the biggest endeavor of our time or of our lives, a marketplace that is also a learning hub for uh, uh, shortening the uh, distance between eco consumers and uh, eco vendors, which are the same people after all, you know, the eco vendors like myself. We are uh, consumers as well. And we have, you know, trading, off trading all the time uh, between purchases. So I think a purchases can be a game changer. So we are launching this marketplace where uh, vendors can rank themselves uh, through uh, benchmarks, sustainability benchmarks. So we ask them uh, to self assess themselves through ethics and also through uh, uh, an open source uh, framework. So it is a great moment. I think a Glasgow, uh, it's a great opportunity. And also it, it is a, a great challenge because we don't want to repeat what we did for the previous corps. This is 26. It means that for 26 times, we have been sitting together thinking of what to do to, for the climate cause. And we need to create a roadmap now. It's necessary. Fantastic, Izzy. Thank you so much for that. And I thank people for just landing you on the spot, asking you to come on and speak about your business and your thing. I quite like Sasha if she's about, hopefully she is, because this, you're the star of the show. If you could just jump back on Sasha and tell us a bit about uh, some of the businesses that have been reaching out to you and how they how they are seeking to get involved. Some of the yeah, stories. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. I, um, I did really want to actually come back on and, and mention some of that. So obviously we've heard from a few different businesses some inspiring stories uh, this evening. And I kind of just wanted to say why I think those stories are so important. I've worked in conservation for over 20 years now, and we often talk about the kind of natural solutions to, to climate, but there's a, just a couple, of, a couple of experiences I wanted to share, um, and which will kind of explain why I think the company stories are so important. So on our expedition, we've been categorizing the different stories you want to tell on the way around, apart from tangible examples of climate change. We've got nature and farming, home and community, but also um, industry and innovation. And yeah, why in particular is that so important? Well, small story from my last expedition, there was a significant ground crew on that. And there were a couple of them in a WhatsApp chat a few months, well, a few months ago, maybe it was a year ago now, um, who I found uh, making derogatory comments about Greta Thunberg and calling themselves climate skeptics, which is a fairly kind of unusual thing in a, in a conservation kind of project where we have seen examples of climate change ourselves directly. And when I approached them directly about it, they weren't climate skeptics. They didn't have any particular new news uh, or new information about it. Uh, what they could not stomach was the fear message, which I think we've spoken about here a bit more. And so that very message was kind of turning people away um, and the real reason that I cared about those two individuals that for me they are actually the two people on an expedition that when 
everything fell apart. There was a major crisis. They're the two most practical people that I would turn to for a solution. And that I did on the last expedition. So it was a bit of a moment of revelation to me that actually the, the, we needed a different sort of story and new stories for people. And what particularly worked for them was when I mentioned some of the big changes that some large companies are making, the big statements they're making, shifts in direction, that to the two of them who are both in business were was a kind of uh, a game changer for them really motivating so i think a lot of the business stories that you're telling um are going to be ones that really inspire a group of people that aren't currently connected um and there's another important reason uh, and it's about I suppose different layers of storytelling and i started off as a proper scientist and have had the uncomfortable journey into realizing actually that story is so is so important um, and one of those was on my last expedition that we realized that crazy lady trying to be a human swan um, definitely gets people's attention. That gets your foot in the door. That gets a meeting. It gets the, the kids out. It gets the kind of hunters wanting to talk to you. Um, and then talking about the sort of science and the story of the birds and things that got people's imagination going. But the only thing that made people start saying, well, I could do something or even why hasn't I been asked to help was when I told stories of other people who had done something to help and positioned them as the heroes in actually the saving the saving the swans. And so I kind of like to apply that um, directly to here that actually, whilst we're gonna raise attention via the record and lady trying to break a, break a world record, the thing that's gonna really motivate people and companies uh, alike are stories of stories like yours. So um, thank you very much for being integral to, um, to the success of this project in, in many ways. When you spoke about storytellers, it was something I think Epsi, I think maybe even Keith mentioned, so it just so happens so we've got John Brown, who I'm going to ask in a second if he can come on and tell us a bit about the essential work that John Brown's doing. We've got a few other people. I've been sending private messages to say I'm going to come to you. One I'll mention quickly is Stephen McTaggart from The Herald, because businesses who want to try and do stuff in this space will either be accused of greenwash or, or something, right? So we need to get to the reality of it. John, you want to tell us how the important work you're doing is going to help try and uh, help us cut through some of this? Uh, that's Nonsense. extraordinarily kind of you. Thank you. Um, and and wow, what a what a, what a tremendously energising discussion this is, which I think is part and parcel of really the task that um, hopefully I'm uh, going to be working on alongside um, the PRCA, which is the largest uh, communications body uh, globally. I think now um, represents a, a heap of sort of PRs and bearded creatives like myself. Um, and actually, the focus is. It is very much how we can change the narrative, um, uh, which I'm so delighted to hear from from this from this call from this um, from this gathering is moving towards a more positive, actionable, inspirational environment rather than a potentially alarmist, fearful sort of situation, which I think a lot of organisations and individuals find themselves in. Um, and the work that we've already started with the great help of Martin, of course, as well. Uh, it's to firstly understand what the benchmark is and what we've found is that there's still an awful lot of fear to not just get involved in the discussion and take action, but actually once you've taken that action, even people are fearful to share their success uh, and, and to actually tell the stories of, of extraordinary success that are already taking place. And we want that narrative to change. So some of the work which I'll be doing with the PRCA is looking at how we can empower and arm the comms professionals out there that all are hope are all representing your organizations or institutions effectively already but to give them the confidence the tools and the clarity that they need to really steer this discussion towards positive outcomes to share some absolute best practice and to actually celebrate some of the achievements that have already taken place and carve out a roadmap for what we need to do in the future as well so i'm delighted to have been invited to this and very very excited and energized by what we could potentially do together Fantastic, John. Right, I'm going to ask at this point now, we've got about 10 or 12 minutes to go. I've, I'm going to do it alphabetically because there's so many people texting me about messages. Can I ask Sasha a question? Uh, Ash Penley is here. If Ash can ask a question to Sasha direct, I think, and then after that, Amanda Rock can come on uh, next straight afterwards. Thank you. And then just stick your hand up. Ash, over to you. Hi, Sasha. This is Ash Penley from Zoex Power. What do you feel when you're up in the air, can you tell us how you feel when you're flying? Thank you. 
<laughs> Very good question. <laughs> <laughs> How I feel when I'm flying. Uh, it depends on the air and the, the weather on the day, but most of the time I'm pretty focused on where I'm going to next or looking at the landscape or taking photographs. Um, but yeah, it's probably for me, certainly at the moment, the flying moments are the moment of calm because on the ground there's been so much fundraising, planning, um, various different elements of expeditions that yeah, at the moment, the um, the moments in the sky are um, are definitely escape and calm. But it wasn't always like that. Um, the closest I can, um, the closest way to explain it is like a child's swing. Imagine hanging from a child's swing, but five hundred or a thousand feet in the air with your legs uh, dangling over over the land, and that gives you a bit of an idea of what it's like when you first start. Um, but after um, after a bit of time, it yeah comes kind of part of you so I probably now feel more like a bird than I ever thought that I would. <laughs> Did I wish Thank we had you. oh sorry Ash sorry carry on. Thank you. Thank you. I, I wish we had two hours. These these meetings I did say at the beginning they kind of go like that. There's something strange happening with the laws of physics when Sasha Dench is about for some reason but hopefully physics will support you. Amanda Brock I'm going to ask you if you can come on and and I'm just actually looking at the gallery at the moment and I see Everyone that I'm absolutely in awe of, Inga, you know, Neil McMartin with the bike behind you and Lydia, there are just so many people I would love to have the time to speak to, but we're not going to. So please use that chat forum to share stuff about things. Amanda, over to you. Thanks, Martin. Um, You're welcome. Good evening, everybody. I'm Amanda Brock. I'm CEO at Open UK. We are about the business of open technology in the UK. So open source software, open hardware and open data. And I was really pleased to hear Isabella rather talk about open source already. Sasha, I'm in awe. I mean, I like fearless women, but I also have vertigo and you're making me feel so sick when you're describing what you're doing. So for us, our engagement with the, the whole sustainability process was inspired by COP and by work I've done with the UN previously chairing an advisory on open technologies for them. Uh, we are building a blueprint for the data center of the future running on open hardware, running open source software, which will have open data and we will use sustainable energy and we will put the outputs back into the grid. And perhaps Sasha, I'm also a bit daft. So when we filled out the form for the cabinet office, there was a box that said IMAX cinema. So I ticked it. And we now have a producer on board, uh, an Oscar winning documentary maker, Scottish bloke, who is going to help us make a movie if we're successful. But then we decided to make the movie anyway, because we're also hosting a, an open technology day on the 11th of November in the fringe in the Sky Park. So Sasha, I am convinced that there has to be a way that we can use footage from you flying around somehow in that movie. And I'm sure it's gonna make everybody feel sick when we see that in IMAX and 3D. So I think we have to work together somehow on that. Uh, I just think this is an amazing group, Martin. Thank you so much for including me in Open UK. And I hope that if anybody else is doing anything that they think might feed into our data center project, they let me know. I saw as the hands uh, clean technology, uh, um, green tech, uh, a green uh, power that would be really interesting for us. We have a consortium of six or seven organizations who will do the bits that we're bringing together already. And they're sort of based in the UK, California and the Netherlands. So we're, we're already bringing people from all over together, but we're really open to collaboration. It's what our sector does. You know, we share, we collaborate, we make things that are scalable. We make things that can be recycled and reused. So uh, I look forward to working with lots of you. Oh, fantastic. Thanks for that, man. We're getting to the last seven minutes and kind of like the COP events, the 12th day and the last hours when all the sexy, cool stuff happens, a big announcement. So this is where I'm, that was a subtle hint. So get on there now for these offers, these offers of support. Amanda, if you're looking for any extras, I'm available. Just thought I'd leave that hanging. So if you think about sectors that are transitioning, you think about, you know, oil and gas instead. Let's think about fashion sector. There's a sector that has, you know, an awful lot of challenges. But thankfully, we have Laboni Saha with us tonight. It's going to tell us about the unbelievable work that you're doing and the luxury true fashion week. Laboni, do you want to jump on and blow our blow our socks off? Hi there. Hi. Hi, Sasha. Hi, everyone who's on this call. It's so inspiring to listen to what the amazing work, Sasha, you're doing, but also very stimulated by the conversation we've had this far. 
Um, thank you, Martin, for this lovely introduction. Um, I'm just, a, I'm the founder and creative director of a brand called El Saha. And uh, we are a business operating in a really huge industry, which is the fashion world. Um, sadly, the second most polluting industry from what I understand after the oil and gas industry. So I think while it looks flowery and beautiful from the outside, we do have a huge role to play in doing things the right way and hopefully being the gatekeepers who could you know, stop um, letting not the right kind of product get into the market. So I actually started El Saha six years ago with the hope to create um, timeless collections that don't go out of fashion and out of trend. And I think uh, our message is really relevant at this point in time because I think more than ever, we are aware of the impact that, you know, what we wear on a day to day basis has not only on our mindset, but also, you know, how our individual footprints are. So if you've gone and bought a product, and although some people think I'm not so much into fashion and not, but anybody who wears clothes is actually into fashion. So it's become so important that we make the right choices. And, and I think I'm, I'm really grateful to be able to share this message with everyone on this call. And I think you probably will be able to, it will hopefully be able to strike a chord with anyone listening, is that when we are buying fashion, not to be driven by what trend is being fed to us, because at the end, it's a business um, message. People are, you know, companies are wanting to sell more trend led fashion to us because they want to generate more money and, you know, make more sales. But at the end, if you choose wisely and choose things that are timeless, our individual footprints would, you know, make a big difference and hopefully collectively we can all make a positive change through the things that we are choosing to buy. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my message. I would like to tell Sasha is that, you know, if you are wanting to be seen in timeless items made in a sustainable way through your campaign, I'd be more than happy to dress you and, you know, hopefully we can find a way to do that. Um, and yeah, lovely to meet everybody on the call. Thank you for letting me um, speak, Martin. I appreciate that. You're, you're very welcome. And I'm returning the favour. You invited me to speak at one of your events, obviously because I'm a fashion icon, goes without saying. So we're now getting to the, the kind of last few minutes. I see Stephen McTaggart has posted something. Maybe, Stephen, are you feeling quite kind of boisterous and you want to jump on and tell us something about the 100 Days of Hope and where you think maybe this could feature? Uh, yeah, you was... start your hair first, Stephen. Are you all right? No, it's uh, it's the evening dinner time rush. So uh, apologies for that. <laughs> no, um, no, so the Herald will be launching our 100 Days of Hope uh, next week, which Sasha will be catching up with you on that, um, your involvement in that hopefully soon. But our mission in the COP discussion has all been around um, inclusion for everyone rather than uh, large corporates. So we're looking to spotlight uh, shining community groups, uh, examples of individuals, um, charity organisations, as well as large corporates that have been on the sustainable, sustainability uh, quest, I suppose, um, in Scotland for a number of years. And at the end of it, what we hope to do is effectively have 100 signatures, a kind of declaration that we can take to uh, COP itself um, and include it in a special edition of the Herald, which we hope to have there on the day as well. So the door is firmly open for anyone here today to get in touch, um, whether it's your organisation, yourself, or you have any recommendations of who we should be um, speaking to over the over the coming months. So that's Sorry. that's very much it. Fantastic, Stephen. Sorry, I didn't mean to land you in it, but I just thought it was such a good opportunity because we need much more hope because the hope mobilises, fear paralyses. So it's just over two minutes to go. If you have that killer question, if you've got that amazing offer and, you know, I would much more prefer an offer at this point, do please come on. Tell us how you're going to help. Tell us what you want to do. Tell us why it's important to you. And let's see if we can get any, you know, fantastic offers in the last couple of minutes. It's like one of those shows where you go and you try and get lots of uh, money. You know, this is actually a bit more important than that. This is, we need profile, we need presence. We need, we need John Brown's expertise and Stephen's expertise to make sure, and I think it was a point there that was made by Geraldine, and she spoke about keen to see the net zero opportunities continue to be celebrated. Big clients tell her that they don't want guilt, they want hope. So we need to be able to create that safe space for collaboration when businesses, you know, the oil and gas sector say, we're already complying with all of the regulations, but we're keen to do stuff. And the minute we try and do stuff, we get told we do not want it. So we need to try and be a bit more grown up about this and try and figure out how we can more combat Sorry, less combat, more collaboration. And I see there, Geraldine's come on, made some offer there about uh, speak to Mabit. 
So one minute to go, Sasha. I'm going to ask you if you want to come back and thank any particular speakers. Uh, I personally want to thank every single one of you. I cannot believe the people who are on here tonight because I know every single one of you are unbelievably busy, but you're also unbelievably critically important to this adventure. Sasha, over to you to close the event for us. Thank you. Apologies for the odd spotlighting. I've got a slight issue here. Um, yeah, thank, just to say, and uh, now I'm just in the dark. Anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Just as Martin said, thank you very much uh, also for all the really inspiring stories and that Sasha Clements is going to be in touch with all of you with a bit of an update follow up. Um, including some of the um, some of the suggestions that has come in the in the chat this evening, and yeah, just to to reiterate that we really look forward to telling the stories. We're always also looking for more of them. There's also been a post in the chat for where you can suggest further stories and ideas along the way around, um, and yeah, that we we really really want to help tell those as part of the Round Britain Climate Challenge. Also, because I think the whole country is going to find it really motivating to see. Firstly, that companies are uh, really, really interested in taking climate change seriously. And secondly, they'll be really interested to meet the individuals, meet the people behind those companies to see that they are people that have the conviction that's gonna also help drive us towards net zero. So yeah, really inspiring on lots of different fronts. And Martin, absolute legend for um, <laughs> sharing this fantastically again and for the surprise speaker. Thank you. You're very welcome. The next time I'll make it like David Acker or something. Don't worry. We'll make sure we can we can uh, try and top Nigel. Although Nigel is quite spectacular. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Do not stop connecting with each other. All of the details are on there, and I'm the link between you all anyway. So just contact me, and I'll pass you on. Laboni is going to dress Sasha for the flight, and then um, Steve is going to write about it. Inga's maybe going to make a movie about it, as is Amanda. So there's so many things, and Ash has mentioned that one of the most important questions, what does it actually feel like to be flying? It's such a great question. It's made me think more about, you know, what, what it is you're actually doing. You are a legend, Sasha, and we all are, want to put the wind behind your wings. So all the best, everyone. Have a lovely evening and keep fighting a good fight. Speak soon. Take care, everyone.